Michael. And I'm Stu, and today we are giving you our election predictions. We've covered the election perhaps more extensively than you might have anticipated, given that the podcast is ostensibly about the end of the world. But then again... <laughs> right. But then again, it's fitting, in a way. Yeah, I mean, I think if there's anything... That's apocalyptic in America these days. It's our political situation. So I don't think there's anything. Um... I mean, or at least it, you know, because I do think to be a little bit, um, have a little bit of perspective over the other various uh, apocalyptic scenarios unfolding around the world that are far more serious. I think, if anything, the reason it belongs on the podcast is it actually fits in line with uh, the obsession with apocalyptic thinking in America. Right. And yeah. that everything can be couched in the terms of like, tomorrow, the world as we know it is over, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, and, and, and both sides feel exactly the same about that. Um, and we don't have to get in today into it today about like how serious to take those um, proclamations, those, those impulses. And right. But I think just generally speaking, the the, the rhetoric um Again, it's one of those strange things where some of it feels fair and accurate, and some of it feels like it's really out of touch with what is going on in other places, you know? Yes, I, I will heartily agree to that. But I've also got bad news, which is that, uh, did you know that um, abortion is a human sacrifice that is causing more hurricanes to strike the uh, southern uh, United States? Well, you know, I had sensed that. I, <laughs> that, was, that was your that was your intuition. I was, I was waiting. I was waiting for a reliable source, and I think we we have one. What, That's right. You... Tucker Carlson has proclaimed this in one of his increasingly messianic slash evangelical slash apocalyptic slash Pat Robertson esque. Uh... Yeah, that's what I said to you. Right, he's going. It feels like he's going. Pat Robertson or Jerry what, or Jerry Falwell, you know, or like or, or like some sort of combination. It, it's like he dreams himself almost as like um, if I had to describe it, it would be like Falwell meets William Buckley meets, meets um, Howard Beale, Russell Brand. Oh, you know? Russell Brand. Yeah. Well, well there's there is this like he's obsessed with being a celebrity. Too, well, there's also this head. doomsaying newscaster aspect, which made me think of um, Network, you know, the. Yeah, I'm yeah, mad yeah. as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. That, that there's something about that. Uh, he also says that he believes demons are responsible for nuclear power. Um, Who else could be? <laughs> well, my friends uh, David and Josh pointed out that this is very David Lynch, sort of the Twin Peaks: The Return. There's that kind of demonic aspect to the to the oh, releasing man. of the atomic bomb. So maybe, yeah, maybe Tucker has just gotten cool and he's just, you know, he's become lynch pill, which uh, would be a welcome, well, it's, ch welcome it's change. Kind of like, <laughs> it's, it's a great example of the sort of like attention economy and the obsession of these narcissists that like, yeah, they'll always find new lanes with which to try to like ramp things up and make sure people are paying attention to whatever fucked up shit that they have to say, you know? Yeah, and I think in general that, you know, Tucker was one of the attendees of the now infamous rally at Madison Square Garden, um, mm -hmm. which I think was... Which, was which may have really tilted things. I mean, that was uh, happening as we were recording our last episode last week, and we kind of well, touched what do, on... What do, you make of, what do you make of the impact? I mean, they seem to really, despite the fact that the whole uh, rally was filled with just vicious rhetoric of, of all kinds... It did seem to sort of whittle down to just this Puerto Rico. The kill, joke. the kill Tony thing. Yeah. The kill Tony thing. What do you think? Do, do you think that this is the sort of thing? It, to me, it's an example of how people don't have any idea what actually determines. Yeah. An well, I mean, right. right. Is this like a Joe the plumber or is this a Ken, <laughs> yes. a Ken bone? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, I feel like, uh, what was funny about it was that, of course, Biden, in his last desperate attempt to throw the election to Trump, 
uh, chimed in with his, you know, who's garbage. It's his supporters who are garbage yeah. or whatever. And yeah. the funny thing about that it's was like literally, literally, it's just like, Joe, that's the one thing you weren't supposed to do. Yeah, th- this know? is the one thing we didn't want to have happen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the funny thing was, though, people dressed, you know, saw a lot of this on social media, on Twitter, especially the uh, Trump supporters dressing up as trash for Halloween and, you know, all that. Uh, but I think it kind of backfired because I think the average non-completely uh, internet pilled person probably just assumed that, and then Trump did the the garbage truck incident where he was uh, seemingly unable to open the door properly, revealing a kind of mm-hmm. frailty we associate more with with Joe Biden. It almost felt like in doing that they were embracing the kill Tony line, right? Because like I don't think yeah. Biden's gaff like got quite, had quite the legs for the rest of the world. That nor it does it, nor does his gaffe cancel out the previous statement. That's right. right? No, no. <laughs> like, so it almost it, seemed like they were saying, up. yeah, yeah. It's, it almost seemed like they were saying, um, yes, <laughs> Puerto Rico is an Island of, uh, of garbage or, or what happened, right. which was just right. kind of like, Oh, now wow. we're going around and cleaning up garbage. It, it was very weird sort of mixed messaging. We're leaning, state. we're leaning into this incredibly yeah. offensive. Uh, also like, why do you have, like a lot of people have said this already, but just a loser stand-up comedian who I I had seen a couple of his videos, but I was not. Uh, I mean, you're in the comedy scene; you're actually a comic. Like, are you aware of this show? This is like that he has people. Oh, yeah, on. he has people yeah. on, and they, if they and they like audition, they like do their five minutes or whatever. Well, it's not really an audition. I mean, it's not really an audition. I don't think. I mean, it's basically uh, an open mic, right? Roast, right. right. So the the comedians are kind of sequestered and they are in they get pulled from a bucket and then they come out and they get to do one minute and then kill tony and the panel like make fun of them or tell them they like the jokes or whatever it it's kind of it's one of the sort of flagship shows so it's like the, shark tank for comics or something <laughs> yeah, but but i don't think anything really i I'm, I'm not i'm not so sure because i sort of make a point to avoid it but i i'm pretty sure that like I'm not sure careers have broken because of Kill Tony, but I, it is sort of one of the flagship shows of the mothership, right? The the Rogan, yeah, the yeah. big move to Austin that is that is attracted a certain type of comedy, and um, Kill Tony really grew out of out of that. Um, but I, I don't know. I think for me, it's more just about we're we're sort of testing, especially on the the Republican side here, like the limits of the reliability of what, what I kind of call like mere virality. Mm. They feel, it feels like their moves are far too predicated on that universe. Right. They love to get on fucking CNN and remind everyone like, you guys might not know this, but Joe Rogan is more popular than anyone on this network or something, you know, sure. The, the, the ground beneath you is shifted and you can't see it. And I, I don't, when you, when you look at the like last, two elections heading into this third one like i just don't maybe it's actually the impact isn't what people think it is and maybe they've really got it wrong with this obsession with meme creation well this is sort of the the garbage this is like the chris rufo occasion of the republican party right where his whole idea is like we have to associate dems with uh, critical race theory and make critical race theory a bad word that then as soon as yeah. people hear it, it triggers this and, and where he's just kind of saying his evil plan out loud on Twitter. Yeah. And then we watch it be, and you know, he did this, they did this with critical race theory um, with gender, with, with various anti-trans positions and, and mm-hmm. the trans bathroom stuff and the like, like all of this comes out of this brain trust that, as you say, seems geared towards um, really tapping into that right wing online kind yep. of uh, rage bait meme culture, sort of the, the 4chan that has moved into the mainstream of the Republican Party. Right. Well, and it's, it's also interesting because th- these people are uh, very loud, but I mean, traditionally very hard to mobilize to actually vote. Right. And yeah. And, you know, you sort of saw the same thing with with Bernie, where like the youth vote actually didn't come out in quite the numbers that were needed to sustain the thing after the the kneecapping. And it's a very I think it's a it's a very weird strategy in the end. And again, again, I think it's 
a bit of a retrospective already, even though tomorrow is it's still it's all still to come, as they say. But I, you know, we were talking a bit before we before we started here, and it does feel like the, you know, to quote Jalen Brown, that the energy has shifted <laughs> um, at least a little bit, right? Like after pretty consistently good polling that suggested that Trump was like certainly had like a tiny but real lead, I think, in the swing states. Um, seems to have dissipated completely right in the run-up, right in the last few days. And of course, people are trying to figure out why. They're saying it's the Puerto Rico thing. There's a lot of people who have been talking for a long time that, you know, this, the abortion issue... Um, has, been a, un, a, has been discounted too much. Like they have Right, so you're starting, you, you know, like the big one that dropped was, you know, and I'm sure a lot of people listening know, but the the Iowa poll from Ann Seltzer came out that... Ann Seltzer, whom we all knew, and we're we're all waiting for her. Right, I mean, right. But what, but like <laughs> what we do, what we do know is that like he gives outlier polls and is fairly accurate. Yeah, um, yeah. No, she does have a good track record. But I, I like the uh, the emergence of these people who are pretending like they've always known and we're always yes. you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my God, Ann Seltzer's way. Yeah. <laughs> Because, we're like you know, like real people that, who follow this stuff, like Nate Cohn or Ed right. Germentum or whoever. Like they know right. who she is, and she's a legitimate person. But right, and I think that you know the the one thing my takeaway from that was, I was, I think I saw I saw someone say something to the effect of, you can debate whether Harris is going to win Iowa or plus three is a crazy poll, but. But Trump just it, being like, plus five in Iowa is like terrible. It, it's it's a problem, yeah. right? And so then then you have to start thinking about whether it's local. I mean, the abortion thing is particularly huge in Iowa after the decision to uh, limit it to six weeks and all of that. Um, and and so the question was always going to be who are the late, who are the people coming to the polls that aren't being counted. And now all these posters have been scrambling, being like, "Wow, we might have really been undersampling here. We might have not been doing this correctly." Um, yeah, and you know, and so I, I'll say that I, I was talking to my students. I had class uh, this evening, and uh, you know, at the beginning of, I mean, it's election day is tomorrow, so how could I not at least like take mm -hmm. the temperature where where Gen Z is at on all of this? And one thing that in both sections students brought up was the Iowa news, and. Uh, I thought that was interesting because young people, and at least the ones that I teach, haven't been that, they're not like political junkies. They're not super yeah, engaged yeah. and they aren't on Twitter. They aren't, you know, uh, but they'd all heard of that. And and everyone was like, yeah, I heard that Iowa's like really coming. And I was like, huh, it's interesting that that is like something that broke through to yeah. the mainstream in a way that a lot of other things um, maybe. It also, it also feels like just increasingly impossible to have any sense of what is happening, you know, in terms of the way that you get your information. Well, I mean, right. We've talked about this a lot. We're, uh, and we've both admitted, I think that we're, you know, we're, we're all siloed by our mm -hmm. algorithms to a certain extent. And even yeah. the attempts we make uh, to get out of that are, oftentimes feel futile because what I, what I encounter is, you know, I, I look at political wire, which is a much more, it's a, it's a left-leaning um, ag news aggregator, politics aggregator site. And it's much to the right of me on most issues. And the, and the, the readership and the people that run it are much older. Uh, but even as I listen to their podcasts and I'm like reading their breakdowns, I'm kind of like, wait a minute. Like this is just like another silo, <laughs> you know. Like, yeah. like I'm in my silo, but they're in their silo, and it's like, yeah. uh, I, you know, am I just like looking at it? And, and I guess it's valuable. Yeah, I guess but, like the the like, thing that I, you know, and we'll we'll get to some of the the predictions in a minute. But I think to tip my hand a little bit, I think because it's so hard to understand the state of polling and you know all of the polls that are are clearly tilted in one direction and. You know, people telling you that there's more early voting and what the fuck does that mean? And there are actually signs that way more young people are voting. And, you know, I think for me, it I sometimes look at the way that a campaign is closing. Yeah. In the sense of where they think they are. And I think, you know, for example, something as simple as like, I don't know, man, Trump's been spending a hell of a lot of time in North Carolina. And that to me like i know it's close i mean they're all all these places are very close but these this is a state that he won twice it's close both times like three and a half against clinton one and a half against biden very close but i i just get the sense that they're 
numbers, when I when you look at where he's going and how much he's moving around, and you then look at again the groundwork that they have been laying, which we talked about last week, about this being rigged in a in an illegitimate election. On the one hand, I've heard the argument. Um, a friend of mine said that I think it's not entirely wrong that that's part of their get out the vote strategy is to make it like you have to go. We have to win by so much because so much cheating will go on. So make <laughs> sure you get out. I'm not sure if that's an effective get out the vote strategy. Sure. But I just, even as insane as he is, look, he talked in a more muted way about this stuff in 2016 because he didn't think he was winning. Right. And right. then he didn't win. And then he talked about it in 2020 and he lost. And now he's talking about it again. No, at no point has this guy won an election. I truly think we're going into election day. He thought he was winning. And it seems very similar to the way he treated those other two. Um, Absolutely. Maybe he's yeah. only got one note, but I just think that they think that they are potentially in, in trouble here. And I think like it's always... That, whole, that strategy, which he has, you're right, and we've talked about before, he's always employed, is always a double-edged sword, right? Because on a certain level, if, if they're rigging it, it doesn't make any sense to vote because you're telling everyone that their vote doesn't matter, right? <laughs> yeah. Like on yeah. some, like some people might take that to, to mean that, right? Of course, and, and creating some fantasy that like, now we actually have to win each state by five hundred thousand votes, or we'll lose. That's how much cheating's going on. Well, it's like, but if if there's cheating going on, can't they just turn those votes into Democrat votes? Like, I, it doesn't right. make it doesn't actually make any but sense yeah, logically. I just think there's like these little warning signs. Like, I'm not entirely sure that without the shift we've seen in the last couple of days, that someone like Rogan, who just before we came on, you know, endorsed. Uh, he endorsed Trump. Trump, but in a kind of half-hearted way. I mean, well, not only again, these are the warning signs that I sort of think like may indicate something, which is like, does he do this really if Trump is actually cruising? Winning? Yeah, I, I, I don't really see him doing that. It seems pretty counter to his whole shtick um, to then say that, and I'm not sure what that does either, because I'm sure that most people that listen to him are either not voting for Harris or voting for Trump. Yeah, I mean, I think the, I, I saw a breakdown that something like 85% of his listeners are are um, are going to vote for Trump if they're going to vote at all. Like, I mean, it's so I don't think it moves, again, it doesn't move again, the needle. It's different. And maybe Rogan's influence is such that um, people who traditionally listen to Rogan, I think, are people who are low propensity voters. Maybe that's changed now. I don't know. But again, there's just these these pieces to the puzzle whereas if you look at how harris is closing she's just posting up in pennsylvania yeah like she's not this guy's flying around to four different things and like the whole energy like people aren't at these rallies in actual fact he at, seems at trump's rallies he seems terrible yeah, he i seems mean absolutely fucking exhausted um he's the, the stuff he is saying he's like admitting he's tired kind of for the first time like Look at me, I'm up here. I don't even have to be up here. It it all just sounds like he sounds terrible. He sounds hoarse. His right. And he seems, he seems to really be lacking in vitality in a way that yes. he hasn't in the past. Right. Even when he had and COVID, he had a little bit more edge and vitality. Than... Right. And again, like you, you know, we we mentioned this last week talking about the Mitt documentary where <laughs> they like he knows that he's losing and how hard it is to go out there and be introduced as the next president of the United States 25 times a fucking day when you know you're toast. And if if Trump actually has the idea that he's probably losing, imagine how it affects a man like that at this point in his life, right? Like everything that's spiraling around him is going to be saved by him becoming president. All of the litigation, all everything that's happening. Um, and he's sort of all in. And I just don't know. Um, again, it's going to be really close and it could obviously go either way, but those are the little things that I don't really see coming from the Harris campaign right now. No. And um, just to go back to the Rogan thing, what I found so odd about it was he says he's, he, do, he released a podcast in conjunction with this endorsement tonight. And it's, of course, with, with Elon. And he mm -hmm. says, the great and powerful Elon Musk. OK, so he's the, the Wizard of Oz now. Like, if, oh it wasn't, if it wasn't for him, we'd be fucked. 
He makes what I think is the most compelling case for Trump you'll hear, and I agree with him every step of the way. For the record, yes, that's an endorsement of Trump. Enjoy the podcast. And it's like, um, what? <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> like, 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 well, uh, that's, I mean, Musk is a great example of the silo, right? I mean, Musk's whole, like, public reputation was sort of in the, in the tank after he bought Twitter, right? Ridiculed the, the spending of the money. And like he, he gravitated towards these acolytes and these right-wing people. Yeah. And, and now people like Rogan are like the great and the powerful, the genius, the, the types of things that Musk snake oil salesman that he is like thrives on. Right. And now he's got that audience again. Yeah. I mean, then. Yeah. It, it, the whole Elon Trump thing feels like a miscalculation for Elon, right? Like, if he were a little bit more pragmatically oriented, mm -hmm. he would hedge because, mm -hmm. you know, as we've been saying, it is a very close election. And we, like, he's set it up now. I mean, he's talked about, like, well, if Harris, like, gets in there. I'm going to be, you know, on a hit list or whatever. <laughs> like, and uh, I think they're like, they're really overselling the idea that a democratic win is like, I, I quoted it last week, but it's the Scott Adams thing of like, if, if Joe Biden is elected, you'll be hunted. Right. Like, right. like just like uh, that already happened. Yeah, I mean, like Trump already lost to a Democrat and, and you weren't hunted and you're here right. and you're doing like it, something this about is, it. This is the same. This is the same game of pretend that they all play and have been playing for so long. The idea that someone like Elon Musk is genuinely under threat in America. Yeah. Like as though as though the, the a feckless center right Democratic Party is what going to come after a tech billionaire. Yeah, like, like, come on. Precedent. Are you? I mean, we at? didn't prosecute anyone after reckless billionaires and bankers destroyed right. the economy exactly. in a like worst situation <laughs> yeah. in 80 years or whatever yeah. and yeah. nothing happened to anyone um yeah it's it's a little it feels you know it's it's the the desire to feel persecuted right the desire mm -hmm. to feel as though even though you're on top of the world you're actually the underdog or what have you yeah. right um I, well, let's 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 yeah. just start with the obvious one. Mm -hmm. Who who do you think is well? Okay, let's start let's start a little more more generally. Do you do you think that we are going to have any sense of who won the election tomorrow on Tuesday? Yeah, I think we'll have a pretty good idea. I don't think it will be finally determined, probably for at least three or four days, but. You think it'll be that short? I mean, that's what it was in 2020, right? And we don't, I, I and we like don't have the good. we we don't have the delays brought on by the pandemic this time, right? I mean, but we do have a bigger like legal army and apparatus set up to contest things, right? right? But I feel like mo that almost always goes nowhere, right? I think that's kind of the interesting piece to fall for me is that if Trump does lose, is this energy really there? That is going to be a really interesting piece of the puzzle. Like all of the revolutionary language, or I guess like insurrectionary language that's being used, um, does it actually amount to something if she starts putting up, if she wins, you know, six of the seven swing states? Yeah, um, I think there'll certainly be a lot of noise. I don't know, you know, there'll be a lot of thunder, but I don't know if there'll be any lightning, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't really see a January 6 repeat being on the menu. I feel like that won't sure. be allowed to happen. Mm -hmm. Um now we've talked about will I mean we talked about this a little bit last time but will there be some issues at state houses? I mean I think everyone is going to over prepare for what, you know, the ratification process and the voting of the electoral college and all of that. Um, sure. regardless of of what happens just because there's been so much noise um yeah I, I think we'll I think we'll know though. I think we'll have a pretty good idea by about two or three in the morning tomorrow. Do you think that 
if or today as this episode is going out on election day yeah right right do, do you think that if it is uh extremely close and trump is the one in poll position that after all of this rhetoric you know this repeated rhetoric of 16 and 20 of the democrats as the bastions of we, savers we, of we, democracy, we respect the the results of the right do you think there's a world where the democrats take a real crack at contesting the election um yes but only to the extent that al gore did in, in 2000 sure. i don't think sure. it goes further than that um if there are so who, do you, who, do you, who do you think's gonna win i think harris is gonna win um i've been I seesawing think- all day because <sighs> You know, I, for a long time, I was pretty sure that Trump was going to win. You know, I had a pretty, even, I mean, you know, ever since Harris has become the candidate, I feel like I've gone, and, the, and the, the whole national media discourse, I think, has gone in these sort of sinusoidal, like, uh, 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 and uh, I just think Trump seems so spent and... The lack of people at the rallies feels uh, feels telling, right? Yeah, I, I think it's it, it it's a fascinating moment because it it strikes me as though we're in a in a situation where if we're choosing what makes the most sense as the thing that drives the eventual outcome in these close close races, despite everything, all the bluster, all like all of it, at the end of the day um factors like uh, abortion yeah um just have i think it, it, out, makes... it outweighs even peanut the squirrel or whatever right like... <laughs> yeah, it's very good very good comparison right that right that their their issue has become that you can go the government can come in and kill your squirrel <laughs> right and <laughs> you know if there was going to be um a, a massive turnout in one direction you sort of lean that way that yeah that the thing that politically makes the most sense is that these people are as evidenced by the success of the these guys are weird and project 2025 stuff that the most salient thing going for the democrats is that we're talking about a potential rollback of rights do you want to come out and try to prevent that or not and i think the republicans and guys like musk tried to match that energy with this free speech misinformation censorship stuff right that was kind con- basically trying to em- emulate that yep. they're going to roll back the ability to like communicate politically or speak or protest and all this stuff which which feels and, ridiculous i mean that's, that's and I, it's I, not it's I not going to happen not only is it not only is it ridiculous in the classic trumpian sense that there already is actually a lot of anti free speech and censorship going on for against genuine political opposition but not to the ones that they're actually talking right i mean about. like people getting fired for being a pro palestinian rights or right. calling for That's ceasefire right. and things like this yes right and i just i don't know if trying to create that almost out of thin air um can get people out to the polls the way that a genuine rollback of a an absolutely essential right will yeah. you know which is kind of like it's kind of would be a Harris win in that regard if that ends up being the story. Kind of an interesting um, counter to all of the insanity that we have been witness to since Joe Biden took the stage on that debate. Stage, right? <laughs> that, at the end of the day, it's that a fateful it might, day. Yeah. Right. There might be a pretty simple analysis here to what's going on. I mean, not to mention the fact that it is really hard for someone who is largely hated to win two elections, even uh, even giving himself three shots, right? Yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, that's that's what my instinct says as well. Um, who do you, you think? You also think Harris will win? Then am I to take it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I don't know if I'm if I'm just sort of like coping. You know, I, I I thought I thought Hillary was going to win for sure, and well, I, we, I think we both confident. we both did. I mean, we both dreaded. Uh... <laughs> I, I'm not nearly as confident in a Harris victory as I was of a Clinton victory. Sure, sure, that's fair. I but was I, I was told recently by my friend Evan that I I was like, oh no, don't worry, she won't lose. Like the blue wall states will hold, and I was like, I said that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "What alien version of me was this?" But I, but I believe it. I mean, I think I've just, 
sort of erased my memory of, of my thoughts on the election in 2016. But I mean, as we've discussed on the pod before, I mean, you and I were together as the results came in uh, mm-hmm. in 2016 and had right. been talking about it for some weeks beforehand. Yeah. And it was just kind of uh, one of those real not in your stomach, bottom of your stomach dropping out kind of. Uh, but I think if Harris loses, uh, just to follow back on what you were saying, I, I won't have the same sense of overwhelming crushing dread that i did uh in 2016 uh yeah I in other words i won't I, be as as stunned and surprised i wouldn't as be was. as stunned but i think i would be I, i'd be actually upset. more bothered yeah i mean it, it would it would feel like a worse a more ominous turn for the country that after right. having it's gone a, through to for ratify years. him now feels different than the Trump who who paraded through the Republican primary in 2015 and then campaigned in 2016 and then campaigned against like someone who was also incredibly un, unpopular, you know? Um, yeah. I don't know. I, do you think there's going to be any any upsets? Do you think there's going to be any states? I mean, Iowa is obviously now on everybody's, you know, radar. I, I doubt <sighs> that will actually happen. I mean, I almost think that she's going to keep the blue wall and win Pennsylvania and that's it. And if she does that, she wins by one yeah. electoral vote, <laughs> which is which is the Nebraska or, or two or whatever, you know, like. Right. right. That's, oh, my God. And if that happens, that that'd be quite interesting. I could be wrong, though. She could win. Um, she maybe wins Nevada also and wins uh, North Carolina or Georgia. It's possible. But well, it'll, uh, be inter- it'll be interesting to see because, you know, po- I I've, I've done a really good job of avoiding this, but at yeah. the end of the day, when it gets really close to the election, I just listen to polling podcasts constantly. Uh-huh. And, you know, one of the things that they do keep explaining to people is that, like, close polling models doesn't mean that on the day it is close. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. And that, to me, will be, like, again, I, most of what I'm thinking about is how, how the Trump team will react to a loss, because obviously we know how they'll react to a win. The, <laughs> but, you know, it... It really is like setting up, like not to say it will happen. And like I said, I wonder what the energy is like if Harris does pull it out on the Trump side. But, you know, he had all of this positive moment. He sort of like recovered from the Harris appointment and the momentum Harris had looked like he had like gotten there. And it does read like the kind of script that someone like Musk or whoever would be like, it was, if you notice so many Musk's tweets are like, all week we're like look at all these great results looks like we're on our way to a clear and decisive victory yeah right? yeah, yeah. And, and and so you it's 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 too perfect the fodder of like all of a sudden you know someone comes out and says iowa's going to to harris you know like and, and this is the beauty of their whole logic is that like it's actually more proof of cheating if he is so reviled and and the the sort of like anti-abortion movement is so reviled that like iowa goes blue yeah. That instead of it being an actual referendum on what they actually think, it will just become more proof that like they need to stop the steal, right? Yeah, and I mean, I saw my friend uh, from college over the summer, uh, Tom and his wife, and they live they live in Iowa, and they're they're Democrats, you know, not not like super lefty Democrats, but you know, like mm-hmm. real real Democrats, and. I was talking with them a little bit about it and they were like, no, there's, you know, there's a lot of Trump supporters, but there's still like, there, there's, so they give me a little bit of reason for hope. I mean, my other exposure to Iowa is of course, like the Iowa poetry writers workshop, which is like a lot of friends who've gone there. <laughs> like Everyone in that is obviously like, uh, left, left to the gills. So now it's like, it's close enough that you, you do have to wonder if Caitlin Clark could have tilted this thing. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> forgot about old old Caitlyn. Did she she did not endorse? I take it. I think I I I think she's sort of rather pointedly outside of trying to stay outside of everything, right? Fair enough. I think she she did like a go register the classic. Um, yeah, the most important thing is that you vote. The Rob Lowe NFL hat at the Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what about um, the, what about the Senate? Do you think uh, the Dems have any chance of uh, keeping the Senate? It feels like no, feels I like don't. I feel like it's going to be a probably Montana's lost, right? And uh, it seems like it, which seems. I mean, I, I don't know if that would be in keeping with 
like a you know let's say harris overperforms the polls by the margin of error or whatever mm-hmm. then i think maybe tester has like a chance to stick around but i think that the the house could could i think could the house up. will will probably be tilt down right i um, think so too yeah yeah that's my but i mean you so do you do you think that trump will like when do you think the first time tomorrow or today i guess um Trump will will declare victory. Seven PM. <laughs> Seven PM Eastern time, four PM Pacific. <laughs> yeah. I mean it's 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 gonna be this is really when it starts to unfold, right? Like where where we actually get to see what he and his people have have planned. And controlling you know, they're so obsessed with controlling the narrative of their own echo chamber. Yeah. That I I can I can imagine just the storm of posts about every single good piece of news. I think we're probably going to start getting like, you know, Elon and Trump are going to be posting, you know, totally fabricated or decontextualized evidences of voter fraud. Oh, and deep, deep fakes. They've already been doing. There was a Haitian um, fake video of a, allegedly a Haitian migrant voting that, that was just debunked and immediately shown to be. Right. And I think like, yeah, sort of like bring it back to the closer to the realm of the actual podcast. I think it is um, sort of the the big takeaway for me, especially in in a Harris win. I think it's fair to say in a Trump win, the real like structures and institutions um, may look very different in four or eight years. Um, But in in, in the world of of even a Harris win or a close Trump win, it the big takeaway for me is that the the whole technolo- like technological apparatus is making it very very difficult to have a democracy. It seems, yeah, like I, yeah. The dissemination of information, like you said, the the siloing off of people's eyeballs, basically. Um, I just I and like you said, you think deep fakes now? Like, what about deep fakes in twenty twenty eight, twenty thirty two? And it doesn't seem like there's any real understanding or like desire to curtail that as evidenced by guys like musk actually attacking in the opposite direction which is like no the only freedom is absolute misinformation at all times yeah right yeah. no it's it's, it's and amazing. i just like to me that's the thing it's like obviously trump stands alone as this like threat to the the democracy as america has come to define it right yeah but in terms of the the bigger structure of how these how how a populace is informed and how vote votes are tallied and all that stuff like this seems to to be no matter who wins and again especially if harris wins like this is not a problem that is solved by it's trump not, not winning yeah it's not going away at all and uh yeah that's that's true but uh a problem but the last thing i say is i i i i do think that we and this might be the case for every election from here on out but um it's amazing that there isn't there isn't an outcome in which like Van Jones won't be crying. Oh yeah, yeah. on television. Like it doesn't matter which way it goes. Even if I think I think he even cries if they can't call. If, if it it's a tie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh um, man. But I'm I'm hoping like I'm hoping for like I've I've wanted this for a while now. But I really hope that like you know how they have those just the panels get bigger every year. Mm. I'm hoping for like um, like a Zoom panel style like split screen where there's just twenty five faces on. No, the- where there's like where there's like a hundred and forty. <laughs> you can like sort of there's like it's so small and pixelated. You can kind of barely like, like oh that's Anderson fucking- that's Anderson Cooper and that's uh- <laughs> but you can definitely see James Carville still. Oh like, yeah, no a signature look. <laughs> yeah, do you think what do you think of Cruz? Do you think uh, the this uh, uh, for, I, I former NFL uh, linebacker can uh, take no, him out. I mean, I, the, I read the, the stuff I read today was basically like it's it's not gonna happen. Classic, classic like fake close, and there's there's not actually a path really. It's another uh, Beto O'Rourke scenario, if you will. Just uh, it's also the Cruz is 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 wild to me that he. I mean, I guess it's just like th- this is power politics. It's just like he's he's not liked in Texas. I, no. Or even does he? He doesn't appeal to Trump people anymore. It's sort of impressive <laughs> that he maintained his position. You know, like 
he he was completely humiliated by Trump and then had to like crawl. But right, and Trump then there's people, all the him leaving during the hurricane and him, you know, being in yes. vacation to Mexico or whatever. And, right. Uh, and it doesn't seem like he's really done much of anything. I mean, his national profile seems to have shrunk. No. Uh, but the Texas is, Texas is a good a good example of the utter stasis of our politics, right? Well, yeah, because that's. I think that that's kind of like the Texas. The Texas machine, right? It just feels yeah. like it's kind of ossified, and yeah. it'll it'll take something very dramatic to sort of shake that uh, foundation. And, and and it's probably not the time uh, this election. But well, it's, I think the last thing the last thing I think we should just hit on is sure. That, do you do you see a, any substantial violence coming during this process? Do you think it's going to be performative or do you think there is actually going to be some sort of coordination behind things like taking over of election offices? Do you think someone's going to like uh, assault the reporter? Right. Like th this is the level of, of intensity. I mean, I think that... there'll be sm there'll probably be some small incidents uh, of violence. Uh maybe someone assaulting a reporter or mm -hmm. a polling, there'll be violence at a polling location and or, um, but I don't, as I said before, I don't feel like we're going to have a repeat of what we saw with January 6th. I, I just don't see, I don't know why I don't see, I mean, everything should indicate. Yeah, that I don't really know why you don't see that. Yeah. I mean, you, you <laughs> look, I could be wrong. I'm not, uh, you know, I, I guess I guess to me, it's like, let's say it plays out the same way 2020 played out. Sure. Why would they not do that again? Do you think just because a bunch of them did go to jail? Maybe. Like, yeah, that, I mean, maybe? people went to jail for a long time. There mm -hmm. are. Um, there's. Stiffer penalties in some cases for this kind of stuff. There have been new laws enacted to protect. Will all that go out the window? I mean, you know, yeah. we haven't talked about Trump and Mike Johnson's little secret, uh, which you, you yeah, what is what is this? What do you... well, we don't know. It's a secret, Michael. They haven't. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but I think the implication is he's going to find some way to use the House to to flip the if in the event of a Harris win, he's going to subvert mm. the process in a way that, you know. The leadership. I mean, it would kind of it would be kind of fitting given the way we've been speaking about the election over the last six months on this podcast that we actually are the ones being rope doped and we are now like, oh, I think this is actually going to end up going towards Harris, or oh, you know, I don't even know if the energy is there for that. And then <laughs> Harris wins, and the House hands the presidency to Trump. Would yeah. kind of be the <laughs> perfect way. And then for this there's then there's real apocalypse at that point. Because yeah, that's right. That's that's, right. that's that's when I think things get substantially uglier than they even did in 2020. Right. right. Um, well, I think that's good for our election prediction show. Uh, yeah. But good We're news. Good. good news, you all. We will be back uh, in just a few days. Uh, yeah. I think we're going to put out another episode on uh, Thursday or maybe Friday, depending yeah. on when we get the when we have a clearer picture of like where things are headed. I think we'll we'll, right. we'll meet again and uh, drop another uh, you know thirty to forty minute episode. Uh, yeah, why? Unless unless there's just nothing to bother with, and we'll move back into the world of. Uh, you know, disaster movies and film and uh, <laughs> disaster film, Michael. Well, right, uh, right, right. We'll, well, we will, we'll, we will be doing the purge election day at some point, depending on how things unfold. Yeah, very, very be... soon. And we'll also be getting back into some more books and, uh, it's time to get our brains active again after this monstrosity finally comes to a close. Uh, but it's been fun and I've enjoyed talking uh, with you about it. It's helped me to, to clarify some of my thinking on, on these things and, uh, hope for the listeners. It's been at least, uh, edifying. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's always the dream. Uh, if you've been liking our, <laughs> if you've been liking our coverage, you can of course uh, subscribe to the podcast on the podcatcher of your choice. You can also follow us on Instagram at the end of the world WMS. And if you really like the show, you can rate and or review us on uh, Apple yeah, Podcasts. But only if you really like the show. Yeah, if you don't like it, uh, well, you know, any news, 
any love is good love, so we'll take what we can yeah. get. To to quote, uh, what is that? Ain't seen nothing yet. Is that Jay Giles' right. band? I, I don't even remember. Uh, it's been a long, it's been a long election season. I'm, I'm mixing up my classic <laughs> rock metaphors. Yeah, it's time. For- uh, it's time. It's time to put us put us to bed. Let's get you to bed, Grandma. Grandma Stu. Um, <laughs> but in any case, uh, do you have any final thoughts before we uh, sign off, Michael? Oh, I just, I guess I would say that um, this has been, this has been a blast. And um, if this is the last night of the American Republic, it's been a hell of a ride. Yeah. Well, and until the American Republic maybe ends in the next couple of days, uh, <laughs> this has been the end of the world with Michael and Stu. I'm Michael. And I'm Stu, and we'll talk to you real soon if we are not urged. In the nature of things, it is, of course, Bachman Turner Overdrive, not Jay Giles Band. The podcast regrets the error, and I am self-canceling. <laughs> <laughs>